Yesterday, Shereen and I spent a lot of time talking about the amended complaint in the Brian Flores case with the addition of Steve Wilkes, the one-year Arizona Cardinals head coach, Ray Horton, who sued the Tennessee Titans because he was passed over in the sham hiring process, as Mike Malarkey admitted it to be in September of 2020, one of the most amazing interviews I've ever heard. And I've now resolved, whenever interviewing anyone, to include the question, do you have any regrets? Because you never know what they're going to say. And there's a chance they're going to confess to something that you never would have expected. Anyway, give me your thoughts as you process what's gone on for the past day or so. This case now has triple the plaintiffs, three more teams added to it. Obviously, the second complaint didn't get as much attention as the first one because the first one was the first time somebody crossed that bridge that the NFL probably assumed would never happen. But now we've got three, and now we've got different claims, and it feels like to the average person there's some meat there. What's your take on what we heard and learned yesterday? Yeah, I, In some ways, I almost feel like this – is a bigger deal, especially when it comes to Ray Horton and Mike Malarkey and the Tennessee Titans, right? I think that that's pretty much as close to getting caught red-handed as we've ever seen with somebody, or at least in, you know, lately, right? With somebody totally violating the Rooney rule. You know, I, I, if nothing else, like this should result in a pretty heavy fine for the Tennessee Titans when you have somebody who was a part of that process literally telling you that this is what happened and this was my understanding of it. And we had, you know, I, I had conversations with the general manager and we were like, yeah, I don't even know why I'm interviewing you. We, we know what the result of this is before it occurs. So we've seen teams get fined for violating the Rooney rule before, but especially when this occurred in 2016, this is not something that should have happened. And frankly, it, it, it makes me feel like, oh, you know, the Titans thought, well, we of course know who our head coach is going to be because he was already here. He was the interim guy. We, we know him. We know this. We know that. Like, that's different than what it should be, right? And that's a violation of the rules, plain and simple. And so when you have this kind of, you know, proverbial smoking gun, you're catching somebody red-handed like this, that I think makes a huge, huge difference in what it is that we're talking about. Because you're right, I mean, it, it was a pretty remarkable interview where, you know, this kind of got lost in the sense of an hour-long podcast on a Steelers fan podcast thing that, you know, yesterday when I saw it, only had, I think, 1,200 views on YouTube, which kind of tells you exactly how unpopular this was and why this got buried. So I think I saw you and Shereen talking about it yesterday. You know, somebody probably alerted, it, whether it was Ray Horton or Brian Flores or whoever, like, hey, this exists and this is out there and you might want to take a look at it because it speaks to exactly what you're talking about in this lawsuit. I wouldn't be surprised, as I said yesterday, if Mike Malarkey was the one who made someone aware of it after the Brian Flores lawsuit was filed. Because when you listen to the earnest manner in which he delivers that regret that he had for being part of a sham hiring process, it wouldn't surprise me if he reached out to someone and said, hey, you should go back and listen to this. Now, now, two things I have to say. One, the problem with the NFL being expected to do the right thing here is that the NFL would be doing it in the context of also defending this claim. So similarly to the Dolphins allegation made by Brian Flores that Stephen Ross offered hundred thousand dollars per loss in 2019, the NFL has no real incentive to find that Ross did it and tell the world that Ross did it. Same thing with the Titans. The NFL has no incentive to find that what Mike Malarkey is saying is accurate. And the Titans did violate the Rooney rule because it's all happening in the confines of a lawsuit that the NFL needs to defend itself against. Why is the NFL going to make the process any easier for Brian Flores? And I'll give you a, a, just a general comparison, not a specific example, but back when I practiced law, and if you didn't know, Miles, I, I used to practice law. <laughs> Never but heard of it before. When you, would, when you would sue a company, and I won't name names because some of them actually sponsor various of the programming that we have available, and I hope they never figure out that I used to sue them, but I digress. Um, and, but it's true. But, uh, but somebody's if gonna, you would, Somebody's going to go look that stuff up <laughs> right now. You should not have mentioned that. You just, you just invited something you didn't want to invite. 
if you would accuse a company of sexual harassment, there would typically be a manager who is the one who engaged in the sexual harassment. That puts the company in a tough spot because if they find the guy did it and they fire him, it makes the case stronger. So they tend to rally around the person who is accused of wrongdoing until the case is over. Then they fire him. I mean, that, that's how it goes, frankly. But they have every incentive to back him up because if they don't, accept his version, if they do impose discipline, if they do say, we caught you red-handed with your hand pressed at the bottom of the cookie jar, it hurts them. So that's one of my concerns as it relates to the Mike Malarkey situation. And otherwise, Miles, bigger picture as it relates to the Rooney Rule, I can only think of one time a team got whacked, and it was when Matt Millen failed to comply when everybody knew that the Lions were hiring Steve Mariucci. Sherm Lewis, who was an assistant on the Lions staff at the time, refused to sit for an interview because he knew it was a sham and good for him. But, but ever since then, the NFL will bend itself into a linguistic pretzel to excuse whatever violation apparently may have happened, whether it's Washington firing Jim Zorn and already knowing it was going to hire Mike Shanahan. And the excuse we eventually got after we pressed and pressed and pressed back in 2009 was, well, they interviewed Jerry Gray before they fired Jim Zorn. Now, that loophole has since been plugged. And just a few years ago, when John Gruden became the head coach of the Raiders, unofficially, before Jack Del Rio was fired, then we get this cockamamie explanation that they, they interviewed T. Martin before John Gruden actually signed the papers, so it was okay. So, so they don't like to find violations. They don't like to stand up and tell the world, just like with the injury report and other things that teams do. They don't want to tell the world we got corruption happening right under our noses. They'd rather brush that under the rug. So I don't know that anything is going to come of this. I don't know that the NFL is going to do anything because job number one is circle the wagons, deny, deny, deny. Oh, wait, job number one is try to get the case resolved in the NFL's yeah. rigged kangaroo court where Roger Goodell or one of his designees handles the case. That's not justice. You know, justice is supposed to be the scales. That's this. That is, that is set up for the teams to win, for the league to win. It's shameful. It's wrong. And I hope one thing that comes out of this moment for the NFL is enough people stand up and say, that is a bullcrap maneuver that you guys have been doing for years to rig the system to hide from public view and scrutiny your wrongdoing. I mean, why, I said this today. Why would they feel compelled to have that rigged system if they didn't know they were doing wrong? Anyway, I don't want to get all cranked up again. I'm surprised well, I didn't get fired after some of the things I said this morning. But, hey, you know, well, I, always, I always recommended to employers that I used to consult don't fire anybody until late afternoon on a Friday. So, I don't know, maybe the call is going to come during the show. Maybe it will. Which would um, be something. Let me check my phone. That no, nothing yet. certainly would be. I mean, I guess I'd just be on for the rest of the hour. That would be an interesting thing. No, but, you know, I read that thing that you were just saying about Matt Millen in Playmakers, which is available now. And, you know, if you haven't bought it yet, you should absolutely go to Amazon.com and order that. But that was a I, chapter in the book, which is why I, I fired sort of you on Twitter the other mind. day. Yeah, I retract it. I retract thank my you. firing of you. Uh, yeah, Twitter. thank you. I thought you thank might. You. Thought you might there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then, you know, the other interesting thing to me about this whole Wilkes thing, and you know, adding Wilkes and Horton to it. Right, when you look at the Cardinals and the Cardinals having the situation that they did, where Steve Wilkes was fired after one year, where I mean, the Cardinals look completely overmatched, basically the, that entire season. And I thought it's interesting that he pointed out in the amendment of the lawsuit, like, hey, I wanted Josh Allen. I don't want Josh Rosen. And like, that's maybe easy to say now, you know, when we are here in 2022 and Josh Allen's up here and Josh Rosen is, I think, still on the Falcons or something. I don't know. But he's never. Yeah, exactly. So he's he's never gotten to the point where I think a lot of us thought he might um, coming out, coming into that draft. But, you know, you, you have Steve Wilkes who was basically kind of being a first-time head coach with a hand tie behind his back because Steve Kime got popped with an extreme DUI, played guilty to it, was imposed with a team suspension and a team fine in that summer. But now it seems, was he actually suspended? Was he actually, you know, not communicating with the team or at least at the highest levels of the team because it appears that Wilkes 
was at least hampered by him not communicating with the GM, but the ownership may not have been. At least that's the accusation that's presented in the lawsuit now. So, I mean, I, I saw the Cardinals week two of that season because they played the Los Angeles Rams out here in the Coliseum. And my God, they were completely overmatched. Bradford couldn't move. They lost that game 34 to nothing to the Rams. So I don't know how much that, that affected things, but when you're looking at it and Kime, act, if he didn't actually get punished, like that's another separate issue that may not be taken care of until this whole lawsuit is over, but it's something that at least should be further investigated. I think that it, well, it will be within the confines of the litigation, but again, arbitration oh, by the league is what I'm saying limited yeah. access right right I don't know that the league is going to do anything about it and the league's comment on any of this so far right. has been no comment which is a well, far it's cry a smarter from play than the last cases time. without merit right well yeah. and look especially with six attorneys general now vowing to investigate and prosecute the NFL needs to realize anything it says can and will be used against it so it is better to say nothing it is better mm -hmm. to keep your head low and your mouth shut so you don't say something that's going to cause a problem for you later and it definitely caused a pr problem for the nfl to have a knee-jerk reaction on february 1 right after brian flores files his lawsuit to say the claims are without merit how in the hell do you know they're without merit i mean that was one of the low points from the nfl's perspective in recent years to have the audacity to just say up oh, it's without merit up oh, it's without merit and then we find out as the days go by, well, there, there may be some potential merit to these claims. Well, the Steve yeah, Wilkes I mean, thing, though. It was like though, a week and ahead. a half later. The, I'm sorry. It was a week and a half later. What? Two weeks later that Goodell at the press conference at SoFi Stadium uh, is basically saying like, yeah, there are things that we need to look into and we need to do better, which basically reverses the entire thing of saying, oh, yeah, the claims are without merit. How can they be without merit if we need to if we know we need to do better? It, it, those two statements are in Congress. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not they actually do investigate whether the Steve Kime suspension was real or whether he was involved and who he was talking to, who he was communicating with, who authorized it, who required it. Steve Wilkes knows, and maybe other employees of the organization at the time know as well. That's part of what would be fully and fairly developed if the case would stay in federal court and the lawyer representing Steve Wilkes, Brian Flores, and Ray Horton would have the opportunity to take depositions, to get to the bottom of things, to get text messages, emails, phone logs, etc., to determine whether or not Steve Kime was indeed honoring the terms of his suspension with or without the knowledge of the team. And I would assume that if anything was happening, probably was happening with the knowledge of owner Michael Bidwell. But that's the kind of chaos that can be created separate from the strict legal theories that are brought up in a case. That's why you want to avoid litigation altogether. It can create all sorts of other issues for an organization as things come to light that otherwise would have been kept out of view. So, the Cardinals have a problem. The Titans have a problem. The Dolphins have a problem. The Broncos and the Giants kind of get lost and forgotten in all of this, and they probably have the strongest defenses of any of the teams that have been accused of anything. But again, we'll see how it all plays out in litigation. This is going to be a long and complicated process. There will be developments from time to time. People will reach out to me and say, hey, what's going on with the case? Why aren't you talking about it? We'll talk about it when there are developments. We're not going to talk about it when there's nothing to talk about. When there's something to talk about, we will give it it's fair and due treatment because these are things that need to be brought to light. The only way to get the NFL to change is to talk about these things, to make fans aware of these things, and to help people. It's hard because people compartmentalize the bright, shiny objects and these things that happen that shouldn't happen. But I still think fans and i'm not saying anybody should stop watching football should not enjoy football it's possible to love the game enjoy the game and expect more out of the people in charge of the game i think there's a way yes. to reconcile the two i i, I agree with you um I, I, yeah I, I don't think that this means that oh my gosh you know the nfl is so horrible we have to turn off our televisions right i don't i don't think either of us are saying that but i, I do think the, especially when you look at the Cardinals situation, right? And you have uh, Steve Wilkes getting fired after one season and it was not a good season, right? I mean, I'm not sitting here and I'm not going to say that like, oh my gosh, why didn't they give Steve Wilkes? I, I, I understand why an organization would make that decision. However, Steve Wilkes was not the only person in charge of getting that team okay, right? Like getting that team on a proper path. And I think when you look at what Wilkes is saying, 
the element of privilege is there, right? There was a privilege that was extended to Steve Kime when he was able to engage in what they term in the lawsuit, fireable behavior, but was able to come back, have a complete do-over on the coach and the quarterback the next year, and has now been extended pretty far into the future with his tenure um, for the Arizona Cardinals. All right, so there's a privilege there that was extended to Steve Kime and patience there that was extended to Steve Kime that was not exhibited to Steve Wilkes. And you can say the same thing about Cliff Kingsbury, even though those teams keep falling apart at the end of the season. So I, I think that's another one of these things where it, it's helpful, at least in my mind, to point this out, right? Like there are differences in the levels of privilege extended to different people in the NFL. And some of that, might be structural racism. And that's how you prove cases like this. No one's ever going to get on a witness stand and say, you got me. Yep, you got me. Great job asking those questions. You've backed me into a corner and I admit it. You prove it by showing differences in treatment. You've got a general manager who had the extreme DUI that arguably was fireable in and of itself, 0.19 on 4th of July in 2018. Possibly the notion that he was involved when he shouldn't have been involved and the team bends over backward for him and only gives Steve Wilkes one year, a year that was set up to fail from the get go so he could yes. be the bridge coach. See, I think the, the bigger picture argument would be that if a team knows it's in kind of a weird transition period and it knows it's not going to be good for a couple of years, it doesn't matter who the coach is. So, hey, we can say we have a diverse coaching staff. We hired a black mm -hmm. coach. Now's the time to do it. And then you fire him when you're ready to move on and actually put a team together that wins. That's what happened to yes. David Cully. That's yes. possibly what would have happened to Brian Flores because mm -hmm. Stephen Ross was hell bent on getting Sean Payton earlier this year in the Flores lawsuit, put the kibosh on that. But, but if Flores had gone along with Stephen Ross in 2019 and had gone one in 15, and they get Joe Burrow, maybe he buys him out, clears the decks, and hires a different coach after one season. I mean, that, that's one of the arguments that's being made here, that when it's time for a short-term coach, that seems to be the occasion for a team to hire a black coach and let him fail and then get rid of him and hire somebody else. And that, that's one of those things that just, you know, no one's ever going to admit it. But when it happens over and over again, the circumstances tend to prove it. It can't be an accident if it's happening over and over again. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.